This is a short video about limits at infinity. Uh, so here's the setup, kind of the usual if you've watched other videos that I've made. So A is just some subset of the real line. Um, and I've got a function whose domain is A, it spits out real numbers. And let's suppose that the interval from A, little a, to infinity is contained in our, in our domain A. And in particular, uh, or just for some, so for some real number A. So there's some number A so that every number to the right of A is actually in my subset. So what we'll say then is that a real number L is the limit of this function as X approaches infinity if the following happens. So the formal definition of this is for all epsilon greater than zero, there should exist some natural number K that's larger than whatever that A is that's in your domain, <clears throat> such that for all X to the right of K, we should have that f of x is within epsilon of l. And what we'll write then is the limit as x goes to infinity down here of our function equals l. Um, and so a similar definition for x to go to negative infinity. So here's the setup for that. So a is some subset of the real line. I've still got a function whose domain is a and spits out real numbers. And now I suppose that the interval from minus infinity to b is contained in my domain just for some real number b. So there's some b where this whole interval, every number to the left of b is contained in my domain uh, a. So what we'll say then is that a real number l is the limit of f as x approaches negative infinity if the following happens. And so here's the definition that you would need to know. For every epsilon that's larger than zero, there should again exist some, some number k this time, not a natural number, that's less than b, uh, such that for all x to the left of k, we have that again, f of x is within epsilon of l. And what we'll write, which you've probably seen before, the limit as x approaches negative infinity uh, of my function, f of x is equal to l. So let's do a little example, just getting used to this definition. So how would you actually, you know, uh, formally prove that the limit as x goes to infinity of one over x squared is equal to zero? And so maybe just to get you started, kind of with a foothold, right? I wanna work with that epsilon definition. So given an epsilon, I wanna find, and in this case, since I'm going to infinity, I can take a natural number k, uh, such that for all x to the right of that k, I should have that one over x squared minus zero, uh, which is what the proposed L is, that limit there, right? Is less than epsilon. And so as you're probably used to at this point, this is where you're gonna start. So you're gonna start here and try to manipulate it to see if there's a relationship between um, x, k, and epsilon. And so that says one over x squared is less than epsilon. I don't need the absolute value since one over x squared is positive. And I'm gonna manipulate that. That's true if and only if x squared is bigger than one over epsilon. So if I flip both sides, these are both positive. So you can just flip this inequality around is what I'm saying to you here. And then now what I'll do is I'll solve for x. So x is larger than the square root of one over epsilon. And so what we just said is, well, x is larger than the square root of one over epsilon is equivalent to saying that one over x squared is less than epsilon. So what that just showed me is how big should I make this k? So I should take k to be a natural number where k is just larger than the square root of one over epsilon. So that's kind of our scratch work. So here's how the actual proof works. And here's a picture by the way too. I know one over x squared looks like this kind of bright green function. And I'm trying to say, if I was to throw any epsilon, that ho any horizontal line, in this case, just a height epsilon on the y axis there, could I go far enough right with my x values to make sure that the rest of the graph is underneath that yellow line? And in this case, yes, I'm saying as long as k is past the number one over epsilon and a square root, then we're golden. Then the graph is underneath that yellow line. So anyway, here's the formal proof of what it looks like. So just let epsilon be bigger than zero. Choose k that's a natural number such that k is greater than square root of one over epsilon. So then if x is larger than k, if I square both sides, I get x squared is bigger than k squared, which by hypothesis here, k squared should be bigger than just one over epsilon if you square both sides of that. And now what we'll do is we'll take the reciprocal of all the inequalities uh, and, and flip the inequalities around is what I mean. So one over this should be less than one over this, which is exactly what this says here. One over x squared is less than epsilon, which is what I wanted to show. So in other words, one over x squared is within epsilon of zero, right? Which is, again, what the proposed limit was. More definitions for you, uh, what we'll talk about is, we'll say that a function tends to infinity as x tends to infinity, if the following happens. And so this should be similar, or it should sound familiar if you watch the videos on sequences where we talked about um, uh, what it means for a sequence to tend to infinity. But anyway, for any real number that you were to throw at me, there should exist some k that, again, we could take to be a natural number, such that for all x to the right of that k, I should have that the value of my function is larger than that alpha. 
And so in that case, we'd write the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals infinity. I think I've got a picture for you here just to make sense of this. So what I'm trying to say is I've got a function that just gets arbitrarily tall, right? So if you were to throw any alpha, any real number alpha at me, I draw that line on the y-axis there. What I'm saying is I could find somewhere so that every point on the right of that, every y value to the right of that is taller than that alpha. That's what we're trying to say. So for every alpha, I should be able to find how far I need to go to the right such that the rest of the graph is above that alpha. So it's similarly to say, it's kind of like saying that function's unbounded. It's pretty similar. If that feels, if that feels similar, that's a good thing. So, and then similarly, we'll say that f tends to negative infinity as x goes to infinity if uh, for every uh, beta, every real number beta, there should be, again, I'll take some natural numbers since x is tending to infinity here, uh, such that for all x to the right of that k again, I should have f of x is less than that beta. And the notation for it is x goes to infinity, this limit would be negative infinity. And I got a picture for you here too. So what I'm saying is this would be a function that looks maybe like this blue graph here. So for any beta, any beta that you were to put on the y-axis, we should be able to find some, some x value, right? So that every point on the graph to the right of that x value, so all of these guys, right? is just below that line. In other words, every y value of those points is below that beta there. So that is what this is trying to say. That would be a picture of what it looks like for a function to tend to negative infinity. So again, maybe that idea is kind of intuitive, but uh, the point of this is what's kind of the, the formal language to describe that a function tends to infinity or the formal language to describe that a function tends to negative infinity. So that's what we want to get used to here. And uh, I've got one more thing for you, which is a sort of a limit comparison theorem for these functions as they tend to infinity. So let's say I've got a function and let's say that there is some you know, infinite interval contained in my domain of this function. And let's assume I've got another function g and g is positive for all x's in my domain. And let's say I've got some non-zero number l such that the limit as x goes to infinity of f over g is this number l. Then what I can say is I can tell you about the limit as f goes to infinity and how it relates to the limit as g goes to infinity, if this setup happens. So if l is a positive number, then f goes to infinity if and only if g goes to infinity. And then similarly, if l, the limit of their quotient, is a negative number, then f goes to negative infinity if and only if g goes to positive infinity. All right, and so if you're wondering if you could flip those, no, just because I assume that G was a positive number, you could probably come up with a similar results here uh, if you really desire to switch these around. Anyway, I'm just gonna prove part A for you here. So let's let L be a positive number just to get you used to this. And so what do we know? I know that the limit of the fraction F over G is this real number L. And so I've got that epsilon definition to play with. So this right here, this is a typo, oh, this should be an epsilon. So in particular, for the specific value epsilon, which is equal to one half of the limit here, I know that there should exist some point k such that once I get to the right of k, since I'm going to infinity, right? So once I get my x values to the right of k, the y values of the function should be within epsilon of L over two. And so I'm gonna write that down for you. So there exists some natural number k such that once you get to the right of k, then, in that case, my function is within epsilon, which again, that alpha should be an epsilon, it's right here. It's within epsilon of the limit. So the fraction f over g is within epsilon of the limit here. A lot of coloring going on. So what we're gonna do is some college algebra. If you were to untwist this compound inequality, it would be the same thing as saying that f over g is between l over two and three halves l. And now what we're gonna do is, if I know that g of x is in particular always positive, it's never zero, well that's pretty cool, cause like there's that fraction there, that'd be bad if g of x was ever equal to zero. Anyway though, I'm gonna multiply both sides by g of x, and also since g of x is positive, that doesn't turn these inequalities around. So I get to keep those. So this says that f of x is between 1 half l times g of x. Remember, 1 half l is just some constant. And similarly, f of x is less than 3 halves l, that constant times g of x. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use a comparison theorem that we know. So uh, if f goes to infinity, well then anything bigger than it should go to infinity also. So that implies 3 halves l goes to infinity. And so, well, any multiple of 3 halves l g of x should go to infinity. So why don't I multiply it by like 2 over 3l to get rid of that? So in particular, that is true. Uh, that, that implies that g of x itself should go to infinity. And so what we just did is, if I go back up to the results up here, kind of the forward direction of this if and only if here. If f goes to infinity, then g goes to infinity. Since this isn't if and only if, we need to go the other way. So let's suppose that g goes to infinity next. So I'll do that here. 
So if g goes to infinity, well, then any multiple of g goes to infinity, in particular, 1 half l times g goes to infinity. And where did that come from? I know that that is a function that's guaranteed to be smaller than f. And so the same logic as before, well, if something smaller than f goes to infinity, then f itself should go to infinity. And that's exactly what we're about to conclude. So the limit as s goes to infinity uh, should be infinity also. And so in all, what did we show? We just did the if and only if, right? So we, so we just showed that the limit of f goes to infinity uh, if and only if the limit of g is infinity. And so the proof of the part b up there is pretty similar to this one.